Okay, good morning, everybody, and Hazak Baru. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful uh, Thursday morning as we are studying together Perashat Beha Alotecha. And our Perasha, of course, um, is very deep and rich. Uh, today we are moving to the end of the Perasha where uh, we started speaking a little bit yesterday about the gossip that Miriam and Aharon speak against, believe it or not, yes, their brother Moshe Rabenu. They speak against him. What exactly did they say? Uh, different opinions. They were asking why, why is he still married? They were suggesting that he should get rid of this lady Tzipora who has no pedigree. Whatever it is that they said, is not so clear. And they loved him very much. And they only wanted what's best for him. But, 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 they are uh, punished nonetheless. And it's a, um, <clears throat> what they do is uh, uncalled for. And over here, the Torah inserts a pasuk, which we're going to focus on today, just this one pasuk. So it's an easy class today, but a very, very complicated pasuk. Veha'ish Moshe anav me'od. Mikol ha'adam asher al penei ha'adamah. This pasuk is right here. Right here on this, on this, in this episode. Where Miriam and Aaron speak out against him. The Torah says, by the way, Moshe was humble. He was patient. He didn't get offended. Excuse me? How dare you talk about me? Do you know who I am? I'll put you guys in your place. I'm Moshe Rabenu. Moshe didn't take it to heart. That's how humble he was. You know, in life when we get offended, it's because a little bit of uh, arrogance exists within us. If a person was truly humble, it would fly over their heads. And Moshe was humble, not letting it get to him. This pasuk, my friends, is a lot to talk about. The idea of humility, what does it mean to be humble? Ve'aish Moshe anav me'od. The first thing we note and notice is that the word anav is spelled funny. Ayin nun vav. What's missing? Missing is the letter yod. Instead of saying ayin nun yud vav, it says ayin nun vav. And the commentaries notice this, and there are beautiful answers to this question, just to share with you a couple or a few. Number one, we notice on a numerical level, always we go to gematria. The gematria of the word anav without a yud, ayin is 70, nun is 20, uh, 50, so that's 120, and Vav is 6, so 126, and I don't know how they figure this stuff out, I don't know who's sitting there with a pen and paper doing this arithmetic, but this is crazy, you ready for this one? If you take the last letter of each of the five books of the Torah, so the last letter of Bereshit is Bemitzrayim, Mem, last letter of Book of Shemot is Bemasehem, Mem. So you got Mem and Mem, that's 40 and 40. Last letter of the Vaikra, Leviticus, Sinai, Yud, it's 90. Last of, of uh, Bamidvar, Yeriho, that's a Vav, 6, 96. And the last letter of the book of Devarim is a Lamed Le'ere Kol Yisrael, 31. 26. And what the Torah is trying to tell us beautifully is that Moshe Rabbeinu knew the entire Torah. He knew every letter to the last letter. He knew it all to the last letter of every single book. And he still remained humble. He still remained 126 Anav. Wow. Very, very powerful. If Moshe, with all of his knowledge, was able to remain humble, he didn't get arrogant. I'm richer than you, I know more than you, I'm better than you, I'm better, you know, connected, better status. Moshe never got arrogant. We have to be so, 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 so careful, my friends, never to think because of our success to become haughty. And this is something that we have to constantly remind ourselves of. And we'll get to hopefully some tips on how in a few minutes. Now, there is another answer to this question of why the letter Yud is missing. Remember Moshe Rabbeinu, we're going to read about it soon, 
has one big mistake that costs him the rest of his life. What was that mistake? The one mistake. Very good. Joe's doing it. He hit his wife. No, I'm kidding. He didn't hit his wife. He hit the rock. Okay? Has shalom. Moshe Rabbeinu hit the rock. Okay? And part of that episode, he's, he gets a little bit angry and he gets frustrated with the people. And finally he says to them, Hamin hasela hazeh notzi lachem ayim. I'm going to bring out water from this rock. And he said a very dangerous word. He said, I. And Moshe, on his level, should have known not to say I. It's true, he was the messenger doing it. But even he should have known. He should have said, Yotzi, Hashem will do it. He will motzi lachem ayim. Not notzi us. And Moshe is missing a yud. Ah. And therefore, measure for measure. When the Torah writes about his humility... But it also punishes him for the lack of humility that he had in this episode. And therefore it, in, it includes the letter Yud. Excuse me, it omits the letter Yud to show how he was missing the Yud in his sentences. Based on this, they explain that when Moshe split the sea, it says that he, the Pasuk says, Vayarem Moshe et yado, he picks up his hand, Vayach, and he hits with the staff on the water. Right, Vayach. And he splits the sea. And I saw, beautiful, again, on a drash level, that the word yado doesn't only mean yad hand, but it also could refer to the letter yod. Vayare Moshe et yado. Moshe is guilty for removing his own letter yod in the word anav because of his actions that he did uh, when, he, when he spoke to the people about the episode with the rock. Okay. There is another beautiful answer, though, to this question. Vaish Moshe Anav. The word Anav, again, it means humble. And it's usually spelled Ayn, Nun, Yud, Vav. And here we note that it's missing, Yud. And the answer is because Moshe's humility was missing. Psh, wow. What does that mean? There was somebody more humble than Moshe. More humble than Moshe? Who is more humble than Moshe? The Pasuk says, Vaish Moshe Anav Meod Mikol Adam. Or rather, uh, Mikol Ha Adam. But either way, he was more humble than any man. And our rabbis notice that the word Ha Adam is extra. What's Mikol Ha Adam as opposed to maybe Mikol Ish? Adam is an acronym for Avraham, David, Moshe. You see, three people portrayed superb humility. Avraham Avinu says, Anuchi Afar Va'efer. He says to God when he prays for Sedom, Avraham, pay attention, my friends. Avraham, Mr. Chesed, praying for Sedom, Mr. Not Chesed. Do you pray for your enemies? Avraham did. Avraham prayed for Sedom's welfare. And he says to God, I am nothing. I am afar. I'm, I am ashes. I am dust. So Abraham shows a, a tremendous level of humility. David Amelia says, right? Anochi tola'at velo ish. I am just a worm. I'm a maggot. And Moshe, he says to the Jewish people, Venach numan, what are we? What can we give? I can't do anything. It's all Hashem. So three people were very humble. And Moshe was most humble, Mikol Adam, more than any of them. So who was more humble than Moshe? If I'm telling you that the Yud is missing, because his, his humility was lacking, there was somebody more humble than him. Anyone know who it was? Take a guess. Hashem. Okay. But Hashem is not a person. Who was more humble than Moshe? I can't see that. Abraham Lincoln? No, not Abraham. No, I'm kidding. Okay, who is more humble than Moshe? Shemuel Hanavi. Did you say Shemuel? Okay, if you said Shemuel, you got it right. Shemuel Hanavi. Unbelievable. Shemuel Hanavi. How is he more humble than Moshe? Well, Rabbi tell us because when it came time to address the people, when it came time to help and judge and guide the people, Shemuel would go to them. But when it came to Moshe, Moshe would bring them to him. 
So Shmuel was a little bit more humble than Moshe. Now the obvious question we ask, whoa, why didn't Moshe go to them like Shemuel did if he was so humble? The answer, my friends, is that Shemuel had that liberty and Moshe did not. Moshe wasn't allowed to go to the people. There is a rule. We know that children have to give honor to their parents. What if the parent foregoes that honor? Is that allowed? Let's say the father or the mother says to their kid, you could call me by my first name. You could sit in my seat. You don't have to stand up when I walk in the room. Is the father allowed to do that? The answer is yes. We are allowed. You're allowed to tell your kid, please sit in my seat. No problem. You're allowed to allow your children to say, from now on, don't stand up when I walk in the room. You're allowed. Okay. Now, not only is a father allowed, many people are allowed. A rabbi, he could forego, right? There's only one person in the world that's not allowed. Who's the only person that cannot forgive his honor? Melech, a king. The rabbis say, Melech shemahal al kevodo, en kevodo machul. If a king says, I forgive, it's not forgiven. A king has no right. Why? Because a king's honor is the people's honor. A king represents the people, the nation. You don't have the right to forego on behalf of the people. And therefore, we know Moshe Rabbeinu was a king. Vahi bishurun melech. He had the status of a king. And therefore, because of his status, Moshe didn't have the right to go to the people. He had to bring them to him. So Shemuel was a little bit more humble than Moshe. But Moshe didn't have a choice in the matter. Moshe couldn't be that humble. He didn't have the right the Pasuk says, Vayakel Moshe Ta'am. At the end of the book of Shemot, it says he brought the people to him. And Rashi tells us that this happened right after Yom Kippur. And the commentaries are bothered. Why is Rashi telling us the date? Who cares when this happened? Rashi doesn't tell us the dates usually of events. Either the Torah tells it or it doesn't. And if the Torah doesn't tell it to us, Rashi doesn't uh, comment either. But all of a sudden, Rashi says over here, Ah, it was the day after Yom Kippur. Why is Rashi telling this to us? And the answer is because Rashi was bothered with a very strong question. On Har Sinai, God said to Moshe, Red Migdulatcha, leave, go down. You lost your status as a king because you're only as high as the people are. If the people drop because of the Egel, guess what? You drop. And therefore, Moshe, you cannot be a king anymore. Therefore, if that's the case, how could Moshe gather the people to him? If he's not a king, he should have gone back to them like Shemuel did. And says Rashi, this was the day after Yom Kippur. They got forgiven. They went back up. Moshe went back up to being a king. Therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu had to gather the people back to him. Wow. So very cool stuff going on over here. By the way, there is one day, that there is one pasuk, one time, that it says that Moshe went to the people. All the time they come to him, except for, at the end of the Torah, it says, Vayelech Moshe. Moshe goes to them. Wow. So what changed? Moshe goes to the people. You know why? Because this was the last day of his life. He says, ben, right? He's 120. And on the last day of a person's life, the rabbis tell us, En Shlita. There's no rulership. There's no kingship. We have nothing on the last day of our lives. And therefore, on the day of his death, when he's 120, he's allowed to go to the people. It says, David Lamut. The days of King David arrived. He started getting closer to his death. And the Pasuk leaves out the title Melech. It says, Vayikrevu Yemei David. David's life was coming to an end. What? David. King David to you. No, sir. On the day of death, there's no king. Everyone's just a regular average Joe. Okay? No offense, Joe. Love you. Okay. So, King David is not the king. Moshe is not a king on the last day. And therefore, Moshe is now allowed to go to the people. One more idea on this uh, piece of here. <clears throat> Another proof to this. We know the Pasuk says 
that Vayamot um, Melech Mitzrayim, the king of Egypt, passes away, and the people, and the new king came into the, onto the scene, and the people started screaming and crying. And the rabbis have different opinions. Did Paro actually die? When it says that he died, some rabbis say he didn't die. It means he got leprosy. Okay, speaking of leprosy, in our parasha with Miriam, Paro got leprosy. He got tzara'at. And tzara'at is a form of death. But the question is, why are the rabbis taking the words out of simple understanding? If the pasuk says he died, why would they stretch that to me? No, he didn't die. It says he died. Why, why can't you take it at face value? The answer is because the pasuk calls him Melech, the king of Egypt. And the rabbis are bothered. If he's dying that day, how do you call him a king? He should lose his title. There's no kingship, rulership on the last day of your life. And says Rabbi Bernstein, this is why the rabbis decided that maybe he didn't actually die. It must be if it's calling him king that he didn't die. It has to be that death is meant maybe loosely to be understood as leprosy. Beautiful. Moving on to the next words of the Pasuk. The Pasuk says, He was more humble than Mikol Adam Ha'adam Asher Al Penei Adama. It says he was more humble than any man on the face of the earth. And we wonder what are those words, face of the earth, adding? What does it mean? He was more humble than anyone on the earth. Were the rabbis, was the Torah maybe alluding to space travel? People that were not on the earth? On the earth, you're the most humble. But on Mars, oh no, Moshe. Like who's on Mars, right? So what does the Torah mean? He was more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. Rabbi Gimnoski brings over here in his book on Vedibarta Bam, he says, beautiful. He says, you know what the Torah is teaching us with these words? It's not teaching us about the level of Moshe's humility. It's telling us how Moshe reached that level of humility. How did Moshe get to, that, to such a level of feeling humble? You think about it. He was the OG. He was, he was, the, he was the legend. He was the GOAT. He was number one. He did it all. He went up to the heavens. He brought the Torah down. He split the sea. He rocked Misraim. Moshe Rabbeinu did everything. How did he remain humble? He was not born humble. We don't believe such things. Nobody is born perfect. Cannot be. He was born with bad, bad midot. He struggled like the rest of us. But he got to a level of humility. If he, wasn't, if he was born humble, by the way, the Torah wouldn't praise him. Because that's not an accomplishment. Then you're just like an angel. So, if, by the way, if you have arrogance, you know, you, you should realize that's normal. So did Moses. So did anybody else. We have to work on the humility. The Torah tells us, how did he do it? The Torah says, you know how Moshe did it? Because he reminded himself that he was the only guy to go off the face of the earth. Moshe Moshe went up to the heavens. And you know what Moshe said? Moshe used this actually as a springboard for humility. I like that. A springboard for humility. You understand? He used this not to become arrogant. Oh, look at me. Um, uh, I went to the heavens and you didn't. Opposite, Moshe said, if I went to the heavens, no wonder I reached the levels that I reached. The people around me didn't have that zechut. They didn't have that merit to go to the heavens. And I guarantee you if they did, they would probably reach loftier levels than I. So Moshe's humility was, a, was because, specifically because, he was the only guy to lift off the face of the earth. He used that as a reminder. I'm only, I'm only, you know, a lot of times we get religious. And we, we look at people that are less religious. A lot of times we look at people that are maybe worse than us, more uh, corrupt. And we say, ah, shame on them. They don't know. Look at me. I'm so good. I'm so religious. And the truth is, the truth is being more religious 
should actually be the cause of our humility. Like Ramchal writes in Midah Anavan, in Mesila Yesharim, Ramchal says that by being more, by being more, more wise and by being more religious, you actually have less excuses than the other guy. This is what Moshe constantly did. He reminded himself, I'm only here. You know, he didn't look at people that were Mechalel Shabbat and say, shame on them. Moshe looked at himself when he would see people driving and say, wow, they didn't have the experience that I had. Why am I not even better than I am right now? I should be even stronger. I should do even more. This guy comes to shul once a year and good for him because if he knew as much as I did, he would probably be much greater than I am right now. He only goes once a year because he doesn't know any better. But on his par, he's doing better. You know, in golf, there's something called a handicap. If you know what's a handicap? If, you, if you're supposed to, I think, what's the magic number? 72? 72 is how much you're supposed to score. Three, right? Uh, 18 holes. It should take you 72 shots. Some people, they're not so good. So they give them a handicap. They give them free 18 shots, 25 shots. How many shots is your handicap depending on... So Moshe would look at people and he would say, wow, not that less, but they have a handicap. They cannot score goals like I can. But if I, if I at the end of the match, if I shoot 75, this guy is shooting 73, he's better than me with his handicap because he's not as good as I am. And Moshe was humble like that. It brought him down. It pulled him down. You know, it says, it says in the Pasuk. I'm going to read you a Pasuk over here. Very beautiful Pasuk. First, I'm going to read to you what the Ramban writes to his son in a letter. Are you familiar with this letter? It's called the Igeret Haramban. Very famous letter. Very important letter. He says, my son... Why should man become hori? In Be'oshet, because of your wealth? You think because you're rich? You're going to become now. Look down and talk down to people. And you could think you could just label people and be nasty and rude. It says, Hashem Morish Uma Ashir. Who gave you your money? And he could take it away in a second. And we know people. We see people. That became rich overnight. We see people that became poor overnight. Bechavod, because of honor. Halo lelokimu, honor belongs to Hashem. Your knowledge, your knowledge belongs to Hashem. Who gave you your brains? One tiny mistake. Look at this, my friends. One tiny thing could happen in the nervous system. And a person becomes paralyzed. A person goes into a coma, barmanan. Tiniest thing. We're literally hanging on a thread. How many people that were so secure, they made one bad decision. Or maybe the IRS caught up with them. Or their mistakes caught up. And they lost everything. The biggest person in the world. We are always at Hashem's mercy. It's so scary how fickle, how quick everything could change. So this is, this is what Ramban writes to his son. And the truth is, our rabbis tell us <clears throat> that, um, excuse me, the Pasuk in Yirmiya says, Ko amar Hashem, so says God. Don't become arrogant with your knowledge. Don't become arrogant with your strength. Don't become arrogant with your riches. Now, there is one thing though that bothered me always. You know, even as I'm saying it, maybe it's hitting you. But there is something that is in my hands, no? You're right, knowledge is from Hashem, brain. But what something is mine, what's ours? Anyone know? Hakol bide shamayim chutz miyirat shamayim. Everything is in the hands of the heavens except for the fear of heaven. What that means is that 
my choices, my religion, my fear of God, my integrity, that is mine. So if anything, shouldn't, shouldn't I be allowed to become a little bit arrogant on those things? Those things are mine. So maybe I should look at the fact that I'm so religious as a form, as a, as a right, the right to be arrogant, because that is mine. You're right. The riches is God's. The money is God's. The brains are Hashem's. The smarts, the strength, fine. But Hakobi Deshamayim Chut Mirat Shamayim, and the pasuk that we quoted a minute ago in Yirmiyah ends off and says, "Bezoti Talel." With this, you could become rejoicing. By knowing me. So knowing God, getting close to God, that's something that should actually give us allowance to become arrogant. No? What's the answer? Two answers, my friends. Answer number one is that the humble person is always careful and um, suspicious. Maybe I'm being too nice on myself. Maybe I'm being too critical of other people. Maybe I think I'm better than I actually am. That's where the humility comes in, <clears throat> even with my own fear of heaven. It's true. If I accomplish great things, I have fear of heaven, I can become arrogant. But opposite, because if you're really humble, you'll truly think maybe I'm not doing as much as I should. Maybe I'm being a little bit too easy going on myself, too loose, too forgiving. Maybe I'm too critical on other people. That's one answer that's given to this question. But Rav Neiman gives on his, in his book, Darke Musar, he says something very powerful. You ready for this sentence, my friends? Pay attention. He says humility... He says, good midot, good character, is actually something that should become, that should be natural for us. You heard that? Midot, tovot, he says, is davar tiv'i. It's natural. How could it be natural? He says, because the neshama is a piece of God. When, we have, when God created man, he set us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's because he blew into us a neshama. And that neshama, because it comes from him... We know God is humble. If that's the case, automatically we should be humble from the fact that we have a neshama. So why are people arrogant? People are arrogant because they move away from being in touch with their neshama. But actually, the more in touch with our neshama that we are, the more humble we become. Because humility is a natural result of the neshama. Having good character. Our rabbis say, to stick to Hashem. The Torah says, Ubotid bakun, Cling to God. Follow in His ways. What does that mean, follow in His ways? Tell us our rabbis, if God is merciful, we should be merciful. If God is forgiving, we should be forgiving. Now, how could, how could the Torah demand of me to be like God? We're so far. The answer is, we're not far. Because you have a neshama, which is from him. So if he could do it, you could too. You understand? Unbelievable. So I can be humble. But in order for me to be humble, I got to be in touch with my neshama. I got to be close to my soul. The more in tune with my neshama that I am, the more humble I am. So our rabbis tell us, don't look at your strength. Don't look at how how uh, rich you are, or how smart you are. You know what you should look at? You should look at how, how religious you are. Because by looking at how religious you are, automatically it'll lead you to become more humble. Because by being in touch with my soul, with my neshama, it leads me to becoming close to Hashem. Being close to God means humble. Hashem, by definition, is humble. Can I give you an example? The students one time, they saw the Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael Salanta. This is the story, I don't know, different versions. This is the version that I heard. They saw Rabbi Yisrael Salanta staring at a lamp on the street. You ever went out at night? You saw the lamps? He was just, 
you're staring, you're just awe in awe and wonder. The student said to him, Rebbe, what are you doing? What are you staring at? So the rabbi said back, did you notice something very interesting? When you're far from the lamp, your shadow is huge. As you get closer and closer, your shadow starts to shrink. Until you're right under the lamp, your shadow is zero. Says Rav Salanter, when a person's far from their neshama, when a person's far from being in touch with their soul, with their real spiritual selves, the more physical we are, the more we're chasing honor, the more we chase money, the more we pursue uh, fighting, the more we pursue things and cars and good looks, the more we're pursuing these things, the further that we are from the truth, the more arrogant we become. The bigger our shadow is. When you're far from the source of light, your shadow is huge. Then person starts to learn a little bit. Person starts to forgive a little bit. Person starts to say a little bit more brachot, a little bit more Shabbat, getting a little bit more in touch with their neshama. And the more a person does that, the more humble they become. Because now they, are, they have a piece of God in them that they're actually accessing. A lot of times you see boys, girls, they go to Israel. They come back. They're more religious, but they're more humble. The way they talk. Very adin, very polite. If it's all, it's beautiful. Very respectful all of a sudden. Where did that come from? That came because now they're allowing the neshama to shine. The neshama, by definition has good traits. The neshama is good, humble, kind, forgiving. The problem is, we suffocate it, and we close it off, we box it out, and we make sure we hog, we hog the real estate with our bodies. So part of our job in life is to allow our neshamas to shine. So says the pasuk, it's true. You have yirat shamayim, but that Yirat Shamayim is not going to be the source of arrogance, quite the contrary. It's going to be the source of your humility. Because by getting in touch with your spiritual self, your Neshama, the godliness within you, we will be able to reach amazing levels of loftiness, spirituality, kindness, etc. Okay, we'll stop over here, everybody. We always be Zochet to reach true humility, true levels of Anava, to learn from our Tzadikim. Amen. See you all tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.